Uh, the first question is uh, what are the major reasons for the schism mm -hmm. East and West? The main a schism is a word to tear apart. As you know, the church was one, one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And in the year 1054, there was a formal divorce. It didn't happen, happen over many centuries. It happened over the idea of some theological differences. But basically, it was called the papal claims. The Pope wanted to be the one and sole leader of the Christian church. And the Eastern church rejected that. He said there's nowhere in scripture or in the ecumenical councils that decided uh, doctrine that it makes the Pope uh, the head of the entire church. The church is collegial. We recognize the Pope as first among equals. It's like a board where the Pope can be the chairman, first among equals, but not an emperor, not a king over the entire church. So the five centers of Christianity then were Rome, Alexandria, Egypt, Antioch, present-day Syria, Jerusalem, and Constantinople. And when decisions were made, they were made as colleagues, not this is the way it is. And so when the split came, four of the original churches stayed with the East, and the Pope was by himself. So the reasons were theological, cultural, the West became divided from the East, uh, economic, because Islam came into the mix now. They dominated a lot of the Mediterranean Sea, so there was little contact. Uh, the difference in language. And the most important power thing of all was what I told you about the story in power. The idea of who controls things. In the East, the emperor was still there. In the West, the pope became military leader, economic leader, religious leader. He led armies into battle. In the East, there was an emperor. And the priests and the clergy did only those things that were according to their office. So these things are gone now. These things are gone, and we hope one day to, to reunify. But those are the main, main reasons. You look back on it now, it's really silly. Many of the reasons that were so important then are really quite unimportant now. Okay. In my understanding, there is a theological reason concerning <coughs> Filioque. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. Okay, let me... And uh, the Roman Catholic say, and the Son. Yeah. Filioque. Yeah. <laughs> These are words you don't hear very often. Fili means son and the inclusion of the son. You have to remember that Christianity had controversies throughout the centuries. Okay? In the West, the controversy, which was called the Arian controversy, Arius was a priest, Ari, uh, Arian, Arian controversy, was a priest that essentially taught that Jesus was God-like. He was a created being and had God-like. That philosophy was rejected at the first, that theology at the first council, okay? But it didn't die out completely. So Arianism moved to the West. And it particularly took hold in the Germanic tribes that were Christianized. And so the Western Church said, what do we do now to make Jesus above any suspicion of not being divine. Okay. So they unilaterally changed, unilaterally by themselves, changed the creed in the local council in Toledo, Spain. I think it was 587 AD. And they, and they changed the creed where you, and this you say doesn't make any difference, but in those days, you see, they believed they changed the balance of the Trinity, three co-equals. The original creed said, And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the creator of life, who proceeds. 
Let me see if I can find the scripture. I think it's John. It doesn't matter. Uh, John chapter 6. <clears throat> who proceeds, who comes forth from, from the Father. Who together with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. Okay. Now the Western church said now to move Jesus out of the category of being created and being like God. They changed it and they said <clears throat> the Holy Spirit who proceeds come forth from the Father and the Son. The Eastern Church said, wait a minute. It would be like changing the American Constitution from the Mississippi West without benefit of the entire country having an input. You change this unilaterally. This was a council of the entire church. And so now the Holy Spirit, you change the balance of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit becomes a messenger because he comes from the Father and the Son. Yet Scripture says... That Jesus says, I will not leave you alone. I will send you the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, who proceeds from the Father. He will send it, but he's not begot born of Jesus. So that became a huge controversy. Theologically, the inclusion of the Son, and politically, a big pardon? That's right. And politically, because it showed the West taking unilateral action without benefit of consultation. So that became the first uh, part, the inclusion. Now, it doesn't make a lot of sense today. As I said, today it, people have no clue. I mean, they don't even know who the vice president is. If you watch some of the news on there, the young people today are not concerned about, if you tell, if I bring a thousand people randomly into a room and ask them, what is the filioque? If one person understands it, It'll be too many. So those are important issues then. But now I think there's flexibility. So theological issues, economic issues, linguistic issues, but above all it was really theological issues and many other issues. And the power of the Pope. That's what caused the Protestant Reformation. Okay. Another question concerning Eastern Orthodox and uh, Roman mm -hmm. Catholic is that in your lecture, you said that uh, Eastern Orthodox is the beginning of Christianity. Mm -hmm. Roman Catholics say the same thing. Well, and, uh, <clears throat> the beginning, because well, see, no, there is no question of who's right or wrong. Number one, the New Testament was translated into Latin from the Greek in around 404 by St. Jerome in Jerusalem. Paul preached in a Hellenic or Greek society. Peter, who was considered the first, was Bishop of Antioch before he was Bishop of Rome. So to say who came first, it's like the Armenians say that Christianity was first in Armenia because that was the one that adopted it first. So it was one church. People didn't see it as West and East. All we're saying is, we're not here to, as competition. Um, the roots came out of the Greek tradition using the Greek language and the Greek culture and the church is established especially by by Paul and by Peter not in Rome Rome came later but because Rome was the capital that was the predominant place so it doesn't matter who's first who's second the point is what is the purpose of it all See, the question all of us as Christians, those who are Christians, is why do we do these things? <clears throat> why do we go to church? Why do we have stained glass windows? Why do we have a choir? Why do we have youth services where you, you know, and then traditional, why? And most people don't know it. It's just basically that's the way it is. And, uh, and so, again, it's, it's not important. It's you judge a tree by its fruit. You judge a tree by its fruit. So those issues are no longer relevant from the old days. Okay, here's a question. <clears throat> if you believe in Christ, you'll be saved. You can go to heaven. If that's so simple, how do you make it? Well, as I said to you earlier, uh, see, a lot of people don't, uh, don't, if you ask people, tell me what you think heaven is. Well, it's, uh, 
wonderful place, you live with happiness and joy. There. To us, heaven is to be one in God again as we were intended. Heaven is to be in the full love of God. Hell is absence from God. You notice in the story of Lazarus and the rich man, he was in outer darkness. So hell is this outer darkness, this removal from the light and the love of God. So when a person says, I feel like hell, you notice how we talk in our country? I feel like hell. What does that mean? It means that I am separated from those things that make me whole. So uh, the idea is not, the goal is not heaven. Heaven is, 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 happens like life happens. It is pursuing the goal of being one in God. And one in God is to be in heaven because all of us seek to love and to be loved. Every commercial on television is about being noticed, being loved, being cared for. And that's the important thing. The, the idea of being in the love of God, and that really is heaven. By the way, if you want to read, I think, an interesting book on that, which has is the one by Dr. Eben Alexander, Proof of Heaven. Uh, proof of Heaven. Uh, he was a neurosurgeon who had 1% chance of surviving his... His um, brain and his brain stem were fundamentally gone. It was a miracle that he returned. And he, he sees the kinds of things there that are exactly what we're talking about. This ultimate love. This ultimate joy in the source of where we came from. So this idea of uh, avoiding hell. I'm not worried about hell. Uh, I worry about myself making my, my, own, my own life hell by the choices we make. So it's a different attitude. Uh, and I think it's a healthy attitude because it doesn't involve fear. Do you think that uh, heaven is in terms of future or heaven can be... Heaven begins, heaven begins here and hell begins here. If you live in hell here, how can you know you're in heaven? And if you live in heaven here, how can you adjust or know hell? So it begins here. That's why Jesus was saying in the parable when the uh, rich man said, well, send Lazarus back. And he said, no, 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 no. He says, they have the prophets. They have Moses. We have the church, which teaches us to make the appropriate heavenly decisions here. It doesn't mean that heaven is constantly bliss. It means that Love is possible here, and it continues into eternity. Do you believe in creation or evolution? Evolution is creation. In other words, all of us have evolved from the little tiny little fetus that was implanted in our mother's womb. We're the same DNA, the same everything, but we've evolved and to the persons we are, we're still the same. Orthodoxy doesn't believe that God made the world in six 24-hour periods. That everything that was made was by God, but in His own time. And there is a process. God hasn't stopped creating. Creation is still continuing. We're growing, we're maturing. So there is no, uh, there, there is no uh, argument between science, and even the Pope made a, a comments last week, there is no magic in Christianity. There's no abracadabra proof. I wish I could take the Bible and rub it and Aladdin comes out with a poof. You know, like, let me give you three wishes. No. So the idea is that we're all evolving. It's not a bad word. We believe God is the creator of all things, even the evolutionary process, that God is still in charge of that. And the universe is still growing, still moving. And if do we consider that is a theistic evolution? Yes, I think it's a theistic, meaning a godly evolution. It's not scientific where we were germs and tadpoles and monkeys. No. Uh, God is a unique create. Uh, uh, God, rather, human beings are unique creations, not connected in our theology to any that God created us specifically in His image and likeness. So the story of Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. It's not historical because no. human being evolved from lower form of animals, right? No, no, no. The story of Adam and Eve tells us that God created a special 
being called man in his own image and likeness. But you cannot, we don't take a lot of the Old Testament literally. The sun did not stop. Mm -hmm. The sun did not fall from the sky and all these things. We believe the story of Genesis is an important story <clears throat> that deals that God created everything, but he created man at the end as a special, as a special creature that is like him in the characteristics of intelligence, free will, creativity. That we don't see evolution in the scientific point of view where at one time we were a tadpole of fish and we moved at God. And we are still evolving. The universe is still moving. We're still evolving. Uh, mo most of us in our minds, we were only 25 years old just yesterday. We look in the mirror and you say, my God, uh, what's happened? So theistic revol uh, evolution it's very much a part, and, this, and the idea that people look at the Bible and they say, well, we think the world is 6,422 years old because we counted the generations. If that's what you wish to believe, that's fine, but it's not realistic. It's not realistic. Okay. Uh, that means that uh, the book of creation, story of creation, is a parable. Not literal. Right? Not literal. It's, it's a parable. It teaches us that we are unique beings. But to say that it is literal, like, you know, a lot of people will say, the Bible is inerrant. It makes no errors. That may, that is, may be true. It's how we perceive it. If, it's how we interpret it, how the church interprets it. See, I don't give my own interpretation. I don't go and preach on Sunday and say, you know, I had a revolution. Uh, uh, I had an, uh, a revelation from the Lord last night and the Lord spoke to me and told me, no, the Lord speaks through the church. Uh, the Lord speaks through many ways. Uh, and for us to think that everything in Scripture is literal, it says, if your right eye offends you, cut it out. If your right hand offends you, cut it. Then you have those people, the Pentecostals in West Virginia, who are snake handlers. When Jesus says, you know, you'll be able to drink poison and candle snakes. Nothing will hurt you. You can move mountains. I'd like to move the Sierras. They're in my way to go to Las Vegas. Uh, you know, but these are, these are metaphors and symbols. You don't go and take snakes and drink Drano and say, well, praise the Lord. You see, these things cannot be taken literally. You have to take them the broad idea. Uh, do you believe everything in the Bible is true? Well, theologically, spiritually is true, but not necessarily scientifically or historically true. Okay. okay. What is your opinion concern uh, in uh, Catholic Church that uh, priests are not allowed to get married, but in Eastern Orthodox yeah. are allowed? I'm married, have four children and five grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> and my wife called me and wondered where I was. No. Uh, the early church, the early church for the first 1,100 years allowed married priests as an option, as well as bishops. St. Peter was married because Jesus healed his mother-in-law, uh, his, yeah, his mother-in-law from a terrible headache. So the early church allowed optional marriage. So you, you chose celibacy, meaning to be single, or you chose to be married. The Eastern Church never changed that rule. The Western Church, that's one of the reasons, Western Church unilaterally changed it and said in the 11th century, at the last part of the 10 hundreds, that from a certain period on, all priests would have to pledge celibacy, poverty, and obedience. And in the Eastern Church, we don't have celibacy. Now, I should say 10% of our priests choose to be celibate, their own choice. I could not have been a celibate priest. Uh, I don't have that gift. I'm not sure it's a gift. I prefer to have my children and grandchildren. Yes? I did a little bit study on the uh, celibacy. Uh, my question is, okay, the church says if, if you want to be a bishop, you cannot marry. That's right. But how does a young seminarian decide to marry or to become a... You're absolutely right. I think I, if, I, if I'm a new uh, young student, I like both. Yeah, very good question. 
which is something that I disagree with. In, in the Eastern Church, I cannot be a bishop because I'm married. In the early church, they made bishops celibate because they were always traveling. You could never have a family. You were here, you were there, you were here, you were there. Now I can go tonight on the red eye to New York, have breakfast, go to a meeting for lunch, and fly back. See, so it's impractical today to only have men who are celibate, who are single. That's a flaw, I think, in the church. Another flaw, because I'm not here to cover up and to give you propaganda, is if my wife uh, passes away, God forbid, I can't remarry. So I have to have enforced celibacy. We have a very young priest, 42 years old. His wife died of cancer. He has three young children. Now, he can leave the priesthood, but he cannot go and marry and come back. Stupid law. Stupid. But I can't change it, you see, because I'm a soldier. It's like a soldier or a sergeant or a captain in the army. He thinks the general's rules are really crazy, but he's not going to go and change them. So these are things that the church is working on. But you're absolutely correct. When you're 22, 23, coming out of the seminary, you're full of life and vigor, you have a difficult uh, time. Now, one last thing on this, and this is the scandal in the church, in the Western church especially. All of us, with all due respect here, are sexual beings. And I think one of the great uh, issues in the Western church has been the issue of homosexuality. See, if, if two guys go out for dinner tonight, they're friends. But if they see me out with a lady having dinner, they're wondering, what's going on? So you see, I think uh, uh, that's a great issue in the church because um, uh, a number of very fine, good people, gay people, have um, entered the priesthood. They seem to be okay. There are no women around, so they're not fooling around with anybody's wife. But they have other expressions. And it's caused scandal in the church. And the, and the scandal is not pedophilia. Would you give me another two minutes? The scandal, pedophilia is improper sexual contact with children under the age of puberty, 11, 12, you know, 8 years old, that's, that's pedophilia. The word you never use because it's not politically correct. Yeah, this pen is not cor politically correct. Uh, is, I think it's, yeah. Ephophilia. My God, you thought I thought Chinese is difficult. This is difficult. Ephophilia. Uh, it means improper sexual contact with children who are past puberty, 13, 14 years old, still children, but still uh, have the capacity. So you see a priest going and they've got a 14-year-old altar boy that has been messed up, or a 15-year-old. It's always mostly boys. You never hear of girls. It's boys. And you see, it's difficult when you're a single priest and you live by yourself in an apartment next to the church. Every commercial is sexualized. Everything is up in the air. Even women eating hamburgers looks like they're having some ecstatic experience, you know. Uh, and you begin to, you know, you begin to think, my God, and so it's only human. We, re we recognize that, and at least we have families. Tonight I'm going to go home, and uh, my children are grown, but down the street are my grandchildren. My youngest is uh, 14 months. So there's at least an outlet there. And of course, age takes care of most things anyway. I hope that was a satisfactory answer, because no one is perfect. Nobody, even the Pope, has to send his laundry out to be cleaned. Yeah. <laughs> okay, the, uh, concerning gay marriage, in uh, U.S., already 30 states uh, consider it legal. What is Eastern Orthodox view of gay marriage? We love gay people like we do anybody else. However, marriage, it was originally intended to be procreative. Only in the West, in the last 150 years, do you go out and date and say, I'm, you know, many of our great-great-grandparents were arranged marriages. And they were arranged for 
very practical reasons, economic, family ties, etc. So marriage is essentially to procreate, to have children, to increase the race. Uh, and of course, if, if sexual contact was not pleasant, nobody would want to have children. So God made it in such a way that it, it is a wonderful thing, it's a wonderful gift. But it is in the, in the context of a man and a woman. And the idea of gay marriage is an anomaly. Gays have been around from the beginning of time. But to legalize it and to make it equal to regular heterosexual marriage is really to us an abomination. And um, uh, those states that do it, I think they do it because a lot of lawyers now are seeing great business because even gay couples get divorced. <laughs> so uh, you'll notice in the next five or ten years, maybe sooner, you're going to start having, see the, the question in America and in the West is, well we love each other. We love it, so love is everything, but love is only a feeling. Love changes. It's going to happen next, it's going to be polygamy. I have three ladies here. We love each other. You love me? Yeah. You love me? Yeah. You love me? Oh, yeah, great. We love each other. Who are you to tell me that I don't have my constitutional right to get married to three people? The guy says, I have three uh, boyfriends. We love each other. We want to get... Who says no? Why are, we limiting, uh, why are we limiting it to two people? And this is how the, the culture and the culture becomes degenerate and it falls apart. There's nothing new. The Roman Empire went through it and it's falling apart. Now by saying this, we don't condemn people who are gay. God bless them. But come on, have a little dignity. Have a little bit of shame. Don't go around saying you're proud in the gay parades with all the... What? Just live your life. You know, gay people are not new in this world. They've been around from the beginning. Just live your life. And people ask me, are gay people a welcome in, my, in your church? I say, absolutely. However, dignity, dignity, honor. We don't have those words in America anymore, unless you're a Marine. <laughs> honor, <laughs> honor and dignity. You have it in your culture. In my culture, it says it's better to lose one eye than to lose the honor of your name. So dignity, we don't have that. You, anyway, don't get me started because I'm an immigrant and I was a poor boy. And when I see women spending $300 on used blue jeans that are cut and sliced in here, I think to myself, my God, what's going on here? My mother would have killed me if I would have walked around with jeans that are torn. Okay. No. <laughs> Wait a minute, this gentleman wants to, wants to have a... Sorry. Second question. When you celebrate Eucharist, mm -hmm. you really believe Christ is inside that? Mystically. Yeah, and if, if after the service you didn't, uh, you didn't use them more, what do you do? But see, we have a different, we have a, no, 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 no. We have a different system. We don't have the little wafers. Uh -huh. See, we have leavened bread. Uh -huh. The leavened bread. Uh -huh. uh, meaning it has uh, yeast. Because remember, again, I don't know how much time you have. In the, in the New Testament it says, after the supper was ended, because Jesus met with his disciples in the upper room to celebrate Passover. And Passover is always celebrated with unleavened bread and the bitter herbs to remind the Jews of their bondage in Egypt. But the scripture says, after the supper was ended, after the Seder meal was ended, Jesus took bread. Why would they eat again? And we believe that the new covenant is now no longer what was the old. It's the new agreement with leaven, meaning yeast that rises, that has life. That he took bread in his hands and he gave and said, this is my body. This is my blood. So we don't have the wafers. Our people bake the bread. It's only wheat, flour, salt, and water and yeast and we don't buy it we don't uh, go to a store and get a bunch of uh, you know of the hosts and there out of the center of the bread comes the small pieces which are consecrated and anything that's left over which is not much we consume okay because 
we drink from the same uh, uh, chalice. Now, is there any magic in that? No. Nope. Is there abracadabra? Do we float out? No, but we believe, if we believe what Jesus said, that the mystical presence of Christ is there. When someone says, Christ lives in my heart, it means that Christ mystically is inside. Okay. Now, in the Roman church, there was a theology that sort of been scrapped called transubstantiation. It means that one substance changed and became another substance. In other words, that what was now bread now became flesh. And what was wine now became blood. That's where you have, I think, it's called the mantrix, where people actually venerate the, the sacrament. We never said there was any change in the substance. We always said, yes, it'll still taste like bread and the wine, but the mystical presence of Christ is there. So we never made those kinds of uh, idea to make it sound as though only priests are worthy to take. After all, I'm a sinner. I cannot chew on the flesh. Okay, I guess <laughs> oh, sorry. Th this is never uh, an easy answer. This is probably from his. You did answer one question here, but he had mm -hmm. other question that do Eastern Orthodox say Lord's Prayer? Mm -hmm. And uh, do you have Pope or Cardinal mm -hmm. and so forth? Well, of course we use the Lord's Prayer because the Lord, the Lord is the one that taught us when he asked uh, how do, should we pray and he gave the example of our Father. Notice it isn't my Father. Jesus' prayer, not Lord's prayer. Jesus' prayer. Well, Jesus' prayer doesn't matter. The Lord, Jesus, is the same yeah. thing. Uh, it's like get, uh, getting a Kirkland water or getting a Fiji water. It's the same, same thing, different in any way. So the, the, uh, we, d we don't have a Pope. We have patriarchs. The early church had patriarchs. There were bishops of the... The Pope is the Bishop of Rome. Okay? Pope just means daddy, papa. Okay? And we have patriarchs in Constantinople, which is now in Istanbul, in Alexandria, in Egypt. But there's, you know, they've gotten small now because of the Islamic influence. And so... Uh, uh, we are not a centralized church. In other words, not all roads lead to Rome. Uh, we have patriarchs in Moscow, that, in the Church of all of Russia, patriarch in Romania for all of that. So we are decentralized. No decision is made by one person. It's made collegially, colleagues. And so we are under, the church in America is under the patriarchate of ancient city of Constantinople. Very difficult because we're under Muslim rule, but it survived for 2,000 years. We don't have cardinals. Everybody, pope, cardinal, bishop, is a priest. And all bishops in our tradition are equal. There's archbishop, first bishop, but we don't have any special category of cardinals. There's, we don't have that. Just bishop, archbishop, patriarch. Um, what is happiness without going through suffering? How do you feel happy? Well, there's a difference between happiness and joy. I have a quote I'm going to give you that I always carry in my pocket. I refuse to, uh, I refuse to memorize that I should. And this was written a thousand years ago by a man called Saint Simeon, the new theologian. Don't worry about those things. He says, a thousand years ago, we each carry within our hearts a divine element, torn from the womb of existence and ushered crying into this world. We spend all of our energies in the pursuit of a state of happiness. Notice, state of happiness. Happiness is not permanent. This restless, incessant, continuous drive is no more than that divine element within us seeking its origin. So happiness, or joy, simply means that we have to return to God and find meaning in God because we came from God and we come into this world seeking to replace God with things. You buy a brand new Lexus today, six weeks from now you see a better one, and you say, well, gee, I should have bought that. We're never, we're never content. So there's a difference between happiness and joy. Happiness 
is a process. You'll never find permanent joy is the joy of the Holy Spirit inside, which means that you can live with a piece of bread and a bottle of water and be content inside. Or you can be miserable in the best restaurant with all the best food and still feel miserable. So happiness is passing. Joy is in God. And that's what we should be seeking, our origin, and that's in God. Okay, then the rest are my question. <laughs> okay. You spend so much time on Nicene Creed. Mm -hmm. And this Nicene Creed talk, uh, you say is a Christological view. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I read this, mm -hmm. it seems to me something is missing because it talks about the birth of Jesus, mm -hmm. incarnate and the uh, Virgin mm -hmm. Mary, mm -hmm. then jump to his death. Mm -hmm. He crucified for mm -hmm. us. But this three years of ministry, Jesus' message. But not everything is in that. Uh, any, yeah, and see, it's like the U.S. Constitution. Okay. It says nothing about abortion. Mm -hmm. You think in 1779 people thought about that? Mm -hmm. Now they're using the Constitution mm -hmm. for gay marriage. Mm -hmm. as a, so the idea is that the creed only gives the basic elements of belief. Yeah. Does it, it's not intended to show you that he, Jesus had miracles, he told parables. There are other things. That's just a small yeah. piece of the church. This is, see, the, the question is that the scriptures, where do, we re, uh, where do we derive the meaning of the church? From the scriptures, the creed clarifies certain basic things. Because what did Jesus do? He was born for us. And the key was he was crucified. Without that, salvation doesn't come. And he was resurrected. Those are the main elements. There are a lot of people who did wonderful teachings and philosophy and parables. But only Jesus was, in our position, human and divine. And those are the significant points. The rest we get from scripture. The rest we get from the many other yeah. things in the church. When I read the modern creed, it talks about Jesus' commandment of love, mm -hmm. which is <coughs> most important in Jesus' teaching, but this is entirely missing. Yeah. It's in here. <laughs> yeah, but that's... Yeah, but you free. can't put that in there because Jesus is love, Jesus is mercy, yeah. Jesus is justice, yeah, yeah. Okay. Jesus is compassion. Which do you put? Okay. The yeah. uh, Nicene Creed mm -hmm. is the product of fourth century. Yes. Now, and it was expressed in the culture of the fourth century, mm -hmm. like the concept of homo wuxia, mm -hmm. this kind of, that belonged to the culture of fourth century. No, 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 because you see, when Jesus was asked, I believe by Philip, mm -hmm. he said, Lord, show us the Father. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said, when you see me, you see the Father. The Father and I are one. Mm -hmm. So the idea is in trying to define the church didn't need definition the first three centuries mm -hmm. because it was, it was underground and persecuted. So now as people got up, as I said, they were looking to, to find out to know exactly. So the idea of the same essence showed them, for example, what it meant. They may not have used this example. The example they used often was the sun, the, the star, which you cannot look at, you cannot touch, is the source, is God the Father, who is beyond us, transcendent. The light is Jesus Christ, and the heat is the Holy Spirit. So when you go out tomorrow morning and say, oh, how nice the sun is. No, you don't, you can't say what the sun is. You only know its product, its warmth, mm -hmm. and its light. So uh, either way, you have one essence. The light and the heat mm -hmm. is connected to that source. Mm -hmm. So you have to understand those things because a lot of people think we have three gods. I teach at Loyola Marymount and many of my Protestant students have no connection to the idea that Jesus is divine. Uh, there are country western songs that he's the co-pilot, you know, Jesus is my buddy, uh, he gives me fist bumps. Um, 
you know, all these things. We've lost reverence. If you believe that Jesus is divine, he's not your buddy. <laughs> yes, he's a friend. But there's a sense of reverence that is missing in the West. Okay. Uh, since uh, now the Nicene Creed also reflect the worldview of the fourth century before science, which is heaven is uh, Jesus ascend to into heaven, the three-story universe. Today, no one believes in three-story universe, but I can understand in the pre-scientific time, they consider heaven is about whether symbolic in, things. Yeah. In the Eastern Orthodox need a modern creed. No. Use more than the, the Bible says. What well, <laughs> the Bible says, Jesus is the same then, yeah. the same now, and always the same. That's the problem in Protestant Christianity. We make it up as we go along. If something happens, we uh, bring drums in, we bring trumpets in. <laughs> no, we have to. Uh, faith is relevant, but Jesus. Remember when Jesus proclaimed the the idea: unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you have no life in you. That was, that was an outrageous comment to make. To eat the flesh and drink the blood for Jews was the most unclean and horrible thing. And his disciples, many left him. And he didn't say, hey guys, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Come on, can't you take a little bit of Jewish humor? He said, they left. He said to Peter, are you going to leave me too, Peter? He didn't say, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. He says, uh, no, Lord, uh, you, are, you are the, I don't remember exactly, you are the, the Lord, the, the life. So the idea is that we, what do you mean we're modern today? The language is modern. People, people have to learn a little bit more elegant language. You watch TV today. Hey, Geraldo. Hey, so-and-so. Hey, you guys. When I was growing up, I don't know how many years you were here, there was elegance in speech. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. How you guys doing? All right. <laughs> uh, an ambassador would come in and you'd say, Mr. Ambassador, now is, how you doing, Henry? <laughs> <laughs> so the idea is we've dumbed down the language. We've lost dignity. Those words in there, we have to learn them, not to dumb it down. We have to move up. Anyway, I get excited. No. <laughs> <laughs> in Eastern Orthodox, do you have conservative and a liberal view. For example, in uh, Nicene Creed, you have Virgin Mary. Do, do some of the uh, Eastern Orthodox do not believe in a virgin birth? If do you're an Orthodox, if you're a miracle. Now, if you're an Orthodox Christian, you can be liberal, meaning a, a little more flexible, yeah. not so rigid. You can be very, very conservative and very you know, there are monks who are very strict, the monasteries, who think what I'm doing here, being with a group like you, should not be. You know, like Jews will say, I'm in a great, uh, you know, I, I shouldn't be, you shouldn't be with the Gentiles. But nobody in the church would ever, they may question it, would ever deny not saying the creed in the, every liturgy, from Russia to, to everywhere else, that is the standard creed. We don't change it as our feelings change. To be spiritual is being, it's not feeling. Feelings change. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of things I may not agree with, but I don't change them because they don't fit my own personality. Now, you said that you have uh, liberal and uh, conservative. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. Do you? How I about you? I consider, you my, I consider myself moderate to a little liberal uh -huh. because I think that the faith has to conform to the needs of people. In other words, y you can change the bread, but it's still flour. You can take out some of the gluten, but it's still bread. So there are things you can do. We call it economy. Not everything fits into a neat little box. In our tradition, there isn't mortal sin and venial sin. Sin is sin. Sin is, means in Greek, in the, in the New Testament, missing the mark. Now, uh, do you consider East... Uh, Eastern Orthodox have responsibility to convert other religious people into Eastern Orthodox. Nope. No? We, uh, we, we do not go to Christian homes 
and say, oh, you're a Presbyterian or you're a Methodist. You know, you're all full of it. You know, you're wrong. Now, let me show you something here. No. However, there are missionaries who go to the non-Christian world, non-Christian world, and offer. But we don't come to you and say, you know, everything you believe for 60 years, 70, it's not correct. Uh, you should come to us. No, we don't proselytize. Now, do people come and they're seeking? We don't, uh, it takes, if someone is interested in Orthodox Christianity, we don't say, okay, boom, get you. No, you have to study for six months, seven months, so you know what you're doing. So you know what you believe. Uh, because, you know, uh, emotions change. I'm very excited not being with you. By the time I get to my wife and she's going to say, what did you do today? I say, I don't bother me, I have a headache, you know. <laughs> uh, so you see what I'm saying is uh, that it takes time. You have to test yourself. That's why Jesus says, test the spirit. Be as innocent as doves and as cunning as serpents. I mean, don't be silly, you know. Test everything. So when somebody says, oh, I'm so excited. I saw a videotape when I read a book. Take it easy. Take it easy, you know, and if they stay around for four or five months and they're still studying, then we consider them. Is there salvation outside Christianity? <laughs> you know, that's a very good question. And anybody who says yes or no, I don't know because I'm not God. <laughs> <laughs> if I were God, I would say you're not saved. <laughs> no, no, see, that's not my, that's not my definition. God is sovereign. He knows. I'm not going to condemn some poor aborigine in the inter jungles of Brazil because he hasn't accepted Jesus. He's more holy than I am. Okay. So my point is, I, let me take care of myself and my salvation and those that I'm in contact with and let God take care of the rest. Okay. You wear the cross and uh, that Eastern Orthodox one. Catholic would have Jesus on the cross. What is the meaning, the significance of We the have cross? different crosses. Yeah. The cross is a reminder, like St. Paul said, I delight in the cross of Jesus Christ and nothing else. So we don't see Jesus as a victim. Mm -hmm. You'll never see a cross in the Orthodox Church that makes <laughs> Jesus look. Uh, uh, because Jesus was not a victim. He said... Victor. He's not a victim. He is a victor. victor. Every cross of an Orthodox Christian shows Christ straight with his arms open. Now we know he was bloodied and so forth. But Jesus came into the world for the purpose of giving himself for the life of the world. He told Pontius Pilate, you have no authority over me. If, if it were not, I could call a legion of angels. I have come for this purpose. So he's not a victim. He wasn't like in the old movie, what do you call it, uh, Casablanca, remember that one? Pick up the usual uh, suspects in the street. No, he came for the purpose of giving his life for us. He was a victor. So every cross for us is victory, not defeat. It's a plus sign. Okay, you were born in Greece, yes. right? And you are Greek Orthodox. Yes. It's a false. You were born in India. Do you think you would be most likely to be Hindu? Probably. <laughs> Probably. The key, and then I would be judged how I live my life as a Hindu. God loves all people. Uh, this is the ladder that I, has been given to me to go up. I'm not going to criticize you for your ladder. Now, if we can exchange and we can uh, join together and coexist, we have a saying in the area where we are down there. It says, we are angels with one wing. We can only fly <laughs> embracing one another. Be careful. I'm married, so I'm okay. <laughs> so we have to embrace each other. We have to embrace, especially in this culture. You know, uh, we have to cooperate together. We have to get away from collision to coalition. Most of you are immigrants from Taiwan. You came here, you had to cooperate in your business and do business according to the rules here. When you went home, you could do what you want. If you wanted to speak your language at home, fine. But when you had your business, you had to at least communicate with the local people. So uh, uh, we don't condemn anyone. We don't judge anyone because uh, in Greek we say, if I point my finger at you, there are three fingers pointing back at me. 
<laughs> so, okay, I recent, recently read a news that uh, in Greece, that uh, the Eastern Orthodox priests would not conduct uh, funeral uh, ritual for those who have uh, cremation. And uh, the, uh, the law of, uh, that uh, in Greece, the government, secular government, especially the, the mayor of uh, Athens, says that uh, cremation is good because we need more space for housing. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what is the view of the, cremation the, in, this in, this country, in this country? We view uh, cremation as a pagan rite because uh, Paul says that the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It should not be artificially destroyed. Artificially means, uh, now, if you die in a fire, God forbid, that's the way it is. But to artificially destroy by saying it takes up land or uh, it pollutes the earth is very pagan. Because remember, Christianity was a, uh, a reaction to the pagan ideas of burning and fires. So uh, we believe in natural. Now, we, we don't do funerals, but we do little prayer service. We don't abandon our people, but we don't do the full funeral. So funeral that does a cremation it does not receive the full funeral. We believe that that the Holy Spirit is the, uh, is we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and they ought to be returned to the earth naturally. So, but do some of the Orthodox practice cremation? Oh yes, there there are people who, in their will, they say they want to be cremated, and um, okay, uh, you know, and then we do a short service. God, God have mercy on them. But again, we have certain boundaries and rules. We don't believe in cremation. Okay. One of the uh, important things uh, you did not discuss is the concerning the icon in, mm -hmm. your, in your church. You have the icon of uh, Trinity, right? Mm -hmm. the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But according to Eastern Orthodox theology, God, one, and God is beyond... That's right. That icon you saw at St. Sophia was not correct. Okay. God is beyond. That's right. And why can you have the icon of Father? Yeah, well, God see, that's, that's a mistake because in the West during the Renaissance, yeah. artists began to make God look like a skinny Santa Claus. Long beard, yeah. an old yeah. man. Yeah. That's incorrect. incorrect. God is unseen. Yeah, right. God is unknowable. Mm -hmm. God is beyond us. But it, it filtered into the art mm -hmm. in the West, especially if you go to Mexico, you see Jesus as a young guy and then mm -hmm. God as an old man. That's totally incorrect. But it filtered in and they made the mistake when the immigrants came here, mm -hmm. they copied the Renaissance paintings. Iconography is only possible because Jesus became the image of the invisible God. You cannot show God unless you show him symbolically. And the way we show the Trinity is the three angels that came to Abraham, symbolically. But you do not depict uh, God the Father. He is unknowable and unseeable. Icons simply are images of those individuals or scenes that uh, pertain to those things we've seen and touched. So icons are not worshipped. They're venerated, like you would have a photograph of a grandfather or someone that you grew up with, and you look at them and you say, ah, what a special person. And that's it. We, they remind us of this means. It's a means to draw us closer. So if you go to a gas station and you smell gas, you think about driving. If you come to a church and you smell the incense and you see this, you're focused on the spiritual. So that's what it is. But you were right. Our, our uh, uh, depiction there is wrong, but if, if I replace it, they replace me. Because it's been, a, because it's been around too long, you know. Yes. Uh, further than your services to your people in the church, how do you predict the Christianity prayers daily? Do you do meditation or some other things for 
spiritual exercise. Yes, I'm, I'm only, see, the, uh, it takes me a whole semester to teach this class to the students and I can't do it in two hours. Yes, we believe in personal meditation and prayer. We even have what is called a rosary. Uh, this, I have it on my wrist. Uh, I have it, we have longer ones where we pray and we meditate on the name of Jesus. And the prayer is one word prayers because God knows what we need is to be in the, to focus. See, we, we have what we call monkey minds. You know, monkeys are jumping all over the place uh, in the jungle. And so when we start to pray, we're thinking, well, gee, I'm going to have a dinner tonight. I mean, you start. <laughs> so we can't focus. And meditation uh, is to begin to focus on God without any images, without anything. And so the Jesus prayer for us, uh, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, is something, not a mantra, but it's repeated. And it brings focus, and it brings silence, inner silence, and it brings us closer to God. And to, and to keep our hands involved, we each knot, each knot is a prayer. We have, I have a longer one. It's, it's a prayer. We make it out of wool because the clicking of the rosaries, the Catholic, make noise. So the idea of stillness and quiet is very important in our tradition. Because in America, God bless America, too much noise, everything is noise, billboards, everything else. You go down the freeway, some guy that drives a car like a tank, you can hear him coming, boom, 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 boom. You know, I thought to myself, noise, 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 noise. And, and what I'm looking for in my life now is peace, just a few moments. That's why we love gardens. People are, want, we want to return to the garden. And we're in the desert. The desert is, you know, all this. Uh, so pe we do meditate, uh, but we're teaching our people. But here, everybody's chasing after stuff, and it's difficult. But we're, there's a whole new awareness, a new movement of stillness, meditation, and prayer. And we have different methodologies for it. And it's not the, this is not the time to to talk about them, but we do have morning and evening and uh, prayers. Because the idea of prayer is not just once in a while. The idea of prayer is always standing in the presence of God. Whether you're taking out garbage, whether I go on the road now to get back to, uh, um, to Los Angeles, I can turn off the music and stop the guys from screaming about uh, Obama or screaming about Hillary. And I can just use that as a mobile prayer unit. Keep my eyes open and focus on prayer. Can you give an example of the shortest uh, prayer you do during meditation? Shortest prayer? Jesus. One word. Because the name says, you've not asked anything in my name. We call these mono logistos. Mono is one, logos is word. Mono logistos. Yeah, mono, like, a, you know, and logos, one word prayer. See, you get these politicians who go to Washington and say, Oh Lord, I will hope and pray Social Security gets going, and Lord, help the Defense Department, <laughs> and Lord, make sure that I get my Medicare. Uh, uh, and then you say, I'm, and furthermore, Lord. See, see this? <laughs> Then the last one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you're ready to say amen, and he says, oh, we are, you know, more. And yeah. Anyway. Uh, in the Nicene Creed, you have uh, Jesus was crucified for us. That's right. What is the meaning? Is, uh, what is the Eastern Orthodox view of atonement? Do you have substitutionary atonement or some other kind of atonement is not used because Jesus came and people to say for us well, no, no no Jesus came to take upon himself yeah. the sin to go through death and experience death but death never held him see uh, in many traditions said uh, people say Jesus uh, paid yeah. for your sins. And the question is, who did he pay? The devil? Satan? That means Satan had authority over him. He paid the price to God the Father? This is an abomination to us. You don't want to see your son killed. There was no tradition in Jewish tradition, even when Abraham 
was tempt, told by God to sacrifice Isaac, mm -hmm. to tempt him, for, not tempt him, to, to give him, to see if he was obedient. At the very end, he stopped. So the idea that a vengeful, horrible God wants to see his son tortured and murdered? No. Who did he pay? Nobody. He gave himself. And in giving himself, he took upon himself our sins to open up the doors for paradise again, but death could not hold him. Is this death like martyr? Or no, Jesus is not a martyr. I mean, uh, uh, did he die for our sins? He died for our sins in the sense that he... Now, what sins? Did he die for the sins that I'm committing today? He died especially for the sin of the original transgression and to bring forgiveness. Does this mean that God require his forgiveness, require the death of Jesus? No, God didn't require it. God didn't require it. He offered. Everything in Orthodox Christianity is offering. He offered. He didn't require it. He offered it. Uh, he offered in, in the person, in the incarnation of Jesus Christ, uh, in that incarnation, he offered himself for the life of the world. He was not a victim. On the night that he was betrayed, or rather when he gave himself for the life of the world, all was planned. He knew that Judas was going to betray him. He knew, etc., etc. But yet Jesus, I mean rather, Judas still had the opportunity to repent. Because remember, Jesus was betrayed by Peter. You know, the Catholics say, well, uh, 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 Jesus said to him, you are Peter, and on this rock I shall build my church. But just a few verses before, he says, you are Satan. Get behind me. And Peter denied him three times. Just like um, Judas denied him in a different way. The difference was that Judas repented. Metania, he had a change of mind. He came back and he forgave me. He, he had tears. If Judas, the church says, if Judas would have repented and gone to the cross and said, Lord, I'm sorry, I didn't mean, I made a mistake, I betrayed you, forgive me, today he would be Saint Judas. Okay, I guess time is up. One more question and then I've got to scoot. God knows that uh, Eva and Adam will eat the apple. Did he know? Time, did he know? You know, he gives us free will. That's right. But he give you the free will. He, he oh you know, the idea, yeah, the idea. You know. He knew, he knew human weakness, yes. but he did not deprive them uh -huh. of making that decision. People say, how did God allow 9-11 of those airplanes hitting? What, what, we're watching too many science fiction movies. You want a hand out of heaven to grab the plane, bring it down and shake out the terrorists? <laughs> then we will be robots. Okay, so the idea is God knows, but he allows us to make those decisions. He allows us to be responsible for what we do. And oftentimes, we become victims of somebody else's uh, irresponsibility. It's a very touchy question. I wish I could give you a black and white answer. But if God loved us so well. I'm sorry? If God loved us so well. Mm -hmm. Then why, when he created a human being, he would give us those kind of things and cause so much trouble for the human being, rather than human beings call the trouble. Joy. Yeah. Just give us the joy from the beginning. See, you'll never know what joy is until you've known bitterness. That, that, exactly. That's why A blind person doesn't know what the light is. I asked that question before. That's why I ask. What means it? See, God didn't. God always has loved us. But in the story of Adam and Eve, it is Adam and Eve that rejected his love. Mm. See, uh, I can tell you, if we were friends, that I love you. But you can say, hey, I'm not interested in, in your love. So the point is that God loved all of his creation. But the creation in the persons of Adam and Eve didn't love back. They broke it. It wasn't God that, that broke the covenant. It was them. So we say in Orthodoxy, God has all the power in the universe but he deprives himself of the power to force us to love him. To me, that seems God is kind of jealousy person. He wants people to prove to him that 
they, they, they obey him or not obey him. Because if he, from the beginning, he can make a human being well, and that gives the love, love for the beginning, the first time, then... But love also means discipline, just like we love our children and we have to discipline them. Love also means uh, suffering. Love also means a variety of things. So love is not just bliss. Yeah, but, but this rule, or this nature, the human being, uh, created by God. From the he, he gave us free all, will all, to make choices. All the problem yeah? is caused by God from the beginning. Well, I, mean, I, mean, I, I know this is kind of ridiculous sense. No, that's okay. We all are free to think what, no. But again, uh, if we were robots, uh, there would be no, no life. If everything was planned and we were robotic, what's the point? So the decision you need to make is what you do when you walk out the door tonight. <laughs> you can either make the evening heavenly. Eating dinner. Oh, that's good. <laughs> and and now, now wait a minute, and then it depends what you order on the menu. Oh, I did already. You did already? Vegetarian. I'm sure it wasn't hot chili. No, no? Vegetarian. No? Vegetarian. You see, you made a choice, and you will live by that. Somebody who doesn't have vegetarian and has something spicy, tonight they may be up all night. And so, you know, choices. Choice is key. Anyway, God bless you. Thank you so much for your hospitality. And uh, I hope we see you again soon. It was fun. Our, the time passed. Oh, it's okay. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, professor, doctor. Thank you. Yeah, we're